Hello and welcome back. In this segment, we will be discussing the Equal Pay Act, to some extent, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, and the Older Workers Benefit Protection Act. Hello and welcome back. In this segment, we will be discussing the Equal Pay Act, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, and the Older Workers Benefit Protection Act. We're going to start our discussion with the Equal Pay Act of 1963. And I have asked you earlier in this course to consider when these major pieces of le legislation were actually passed. Ask yourselves, what was taking place in our society at the time when the legislature considered these acts? In 1963, we were at the height of the Civil Rights Movement, and the very first Civil Rights Act, following the Civil Rights Act of 1866, was the Equal Pay Act of 1963. Title VII followed the next year. The ADEA, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, followed in 1967. And those are the major civil rights laws regarding employment which took place in the 1960s. The Equal Pay Act requires that men and women be given equal pay for equal work in the same establishment. The jobs need not be identical, but they must be substantially equal. The focus is on the job content, not on job titles, which determines whether jobs are substantially equal. The EPA requires that employers not pay unequal pay to men and women who perform jobs that require substantially equal skills, effort, and responsibility, and that are performed under similar working conditions within the same establishment. We will be focusing on each of those categories so that we have a better and more comprehensive understanding of what the Equal Pay Act does and what it does not do. In general, the Equal Pay Act of 1963 prohibits employers from discriminating against employees covered by the minimum wage provisions of the Fair Labor Standards Act. We'll refer to that as the FLSA by paying lower wages to employees of one sex than to employees of the opposite sex. Now, we have not yet covered the FLSA. We will do so in the weeks ahead. But the Civil Rights Act of 1964 didn't take place until a year following the passage of the Equal Pay Act. When the Equal Pay Act was passed, it related to the standards, the procedural standards, and terms that the FLSA provided. And you'll read in weeks to come that the FLSA was passed in 1938. The Equal Pay Act was intended as a broad charter of women's rights in the business world. That's the policy. The act does not prohibit any variation in wage rates paid to men and women, but only those variations based solely on sex or gender. Let's look at some of these respective categories. Skill. Skill is measured by factors such as experience, ability, education, and training required to perform the job. The issue is what skills are required for the job, 
not what skills the individual employees may have. For example, the EEOC suggests, and this is just by way of illustration, that two bookkeeping jobs would be considered equal under the EPA, even if one of the job holders has a master's degree in physics. The rationale is that the physics degree is not required for the particular job. So the focus is on the skill set and what's required for that particular job, not what the individual's skills respectively may be in general, but focused on the job in particular. Effort. Effort is the amount of physical or mental exertion needed to perform the job. Again, the EEOC has some examples. The EEOC uses the example of men and women who work side by side on a line assembling the machine parts. The person at the end of the line must also lift the assembled parts as he or she completes the work and place it on a board. The job requires more effort than the other assembly line jobs if the extra effort of lifting the assembled product off the line is substantial and is a regular part of the job. As a result, according to the EEOC, it would not be a violation to pay that person more regardless of whether the job is held by a man or a woman. So effort is a factor in the analysis with respect to whether the pay is the same or unequal and why. The Equal Pay Act also focuses on responsibility. Responsibility is the degree of accountability necessary to perform the job functions. According to the EEOC, the example of a salesperson who has the duty of determining whether to accept customers' personal checks has more responsibility than other salespeople who do not have that same level of responsibility. On the other hand, a minor difference in responsibility, such as turning out lights at the end of the day, would not justify a pay differential. So, with respect to pay differentials, responsibility is certainly an aspect to consider. And the EEOC uh, provides various examples to illustrate the difference and how the standards are measured. The Equal Pay Act also focuses on working conditions. Working conditions encompasses two factors. One, the physical surroundings. Temperature, fumes, and ventilation are all considered within the physical surroundings as our, hand, as our hazards. The EPA provides that employers may not pay unequal wages to men and women who perform their functions under similar working conditions. Let me repeat that. The Equal Pay Act provides that employers may not pay unequal wages to men and women who perform their functions under similar working conditions. Working conditions is a factor to consider whether the pay being unequal violates the act. Another aspect as to whether the act is violated by the unequal pay is establishment. An establishment is a distinct physical place of business rather than an entire business or enterprise consisting of several places of business. In the case of Renstrom versus Nash Finch Company, that's a case in your textbook, the court noted the term establishment appears throughout the FLSA. That's the Fair Labor Standards Act that I've mentioned earlier. Drawing upon the FLSA is the Equal Pay Act considerations. Establishment has repeatedly been interpreted by courts to refer to a distinct physical place of business and not to an entire business or enterprise. Consider the following example, again noted by the EEOC. 
if a central administrative unit hires employees, sets their compensation, and assigns them to work separate work locations, the separate work sites can be considered part of one establishment. Now, we've mentioned the EEOC several times within the context of the Equal Pay Act. When the Equal Pay Act was passed in 1963, there was no EEOC. The EEOC was created by the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Now, how does that have application here to our discussion and our study? Well, the EEOC has been entrusted with investigations relating to pay inequality, pay disparity, pay discrimination. The EEOC has the authority to investigate whether there are those types of violations that are found within the EEOC, however, that are, that are found in a violation of the Equal Pay Act. However, and this is important to note, there is not a 180 or 300 day requirement to first file with the EEOC in order to have the EEOC examine the Equal Pay Act potential violations. One could actually file a lawsuit under either claims with state or federal courts for violation of the EPA. It's not necessary to go to the EEOC as an administrative prerequisite. The EEOC will provide, however, the investigation into allegations whether the Equal Pay Act was violated. To establish a prima facie case of wage discrimination under the Equal Pay Act, the plaintiff must show by a preponderance of the evidence that, one, higher wages were paid to an employee of the opposite sex. That has to be established first and foremost. Two, for equal work requiring substantially similar skill, effort, and responsibilities, and three, the work was performed under similar working conditions. Those are all the factors which we have just discussed and had examples to examine. Now, here's what's especially important when considering Equal Pay Act claims. No proof of discriminatory intent is required. The fact that unequal wages existed or still continue to exist is what the EPA considers to be the violation. No proof of discriminatory intent, such as disparate treatment, is required for a violation of the EPA to be found. After a prima facie case is established by the plaintiff, the burden then shifts to the defendant to establish one of four statutory defenses. In your textbook, you have read the Supreme Court decision of Corning Glassworks versus Brennan. If you haven't read that case, please do so. It will give you a further and more comprehensive understanding about the Equal Pay Act, its purpose, its history, and also what statutory defenses apply. The statutory defenses apply if the difference in pay is attributable to, one, a seniority system, two, a merit system, three, a system which measures earnings by quantity or quality of production. Not all of these various defenses have to be present, but just one if it applies. And then the catch-all is number four, a differential based on any other factor other than sex. The fourth exception is a broad catch-all exception and embraces an almost limitless number of factors so long as those factors do not involve sex or gender. 
the provisions of the Equal Pay Act establish a rebuttable presumption of sex discrimination such that once an employee has demonstrated that an employer pays members of one sex more than members of the opposite sex, the burden shifts to the employer to offer a gender neutral justification for the wage differential. The justification need not be a good reason, but merely a gender neutral one. The justification must be bona fide. In other words, an employer cannot use a gender neutral factor to avoid liability unless the factor is used and applied in good faith. So there is a good faith requirement. Under the Equal Pay Act, differences in education and experience may be considered factors other than sex. There may be a host of reasons or factors other than sex, and that would fit the fourth category as defenses against an EPA claim. Let's talk about remedies and damages available under the Equal Pay Act. The Equal Pay Act, like the FLSA, which we're going to study, does not provide for compensatory or punitive damages. And we know what compensatory and punitive damages are by now. Damages which compensate for harm or damages which punish and deter that type of conduct from occurring again. Instead, liquidated damages may be available. What are liquidated damages? Liquidated damages may be awarded to punish and especially malicious and reckless act of discrimination. The amount of liquidated damages that may be awarded is equal to the amount of back pay awarded the victim. In other words, liquidated damages are two times the value of back pay. Now we also know by now what is back pay. That's the difference in pay up until the time of trial or a determination otherwise that would be owed as damages, which is remedial if there's a violation of the particular law in question. And of course, attorney's fees and costs are available. Let's talk about statutes of limitations. We know from our previous study relating to Title VII, that there is a 180 and 300 day period of limitations which applies. The Equal Pay Act has a two and three year statute of limitations. In other words, you look back on when the action or discriminatory pay occurred and there is a two year period if the action that results in the discriminatory pay practice is not done maliciously or intentionally to harm. That's a two-year period. A three-year period of limitations is available for willful discrimination. In other words, intentional discrimination allows for a three-year period of time to be the measure look, measured look back for when the claim begins to accrue. Big distinction between that aspect and the limitation period governing pay disparity under Title VII. So we've been talking about pay disparity, wage differentials, and Title VII certainly prohibits discrimination based on gender, compensation discrimination based on gender, and using the indirect method set forth in McDonnell Douglas, the burden is on the plaintiff to establish a prima facie case of discrimination. We've studied that. We know that to be the tr uh, we know that to be the uh, standard. This requires that the plaintiff show 
One, he or she is a member of a protected class. Two, he or she was performing the job to meet the employer's expectations. Three, he or she suffered an adverse employment action. That's the element that I've referred previously as the bad situation or the uh, adverse action uh, part or something bad happened. You have to show that there's been something bad that happened, something that obviously negatively impacts and affects the employee. And lastly, the fourth element, he or she was treated less favorably than similarly situated employees outside of the protected class. Now you will note that under Title VII, intent is required. Under the Equal Pay Act, also involving discriminatory pay differentials, intent is not a required element. Let's look at the Equal Pay Act and Title VII wage dis uh, differential claims in a little bit more detail. An employee is similarly situated if the employee is comparable to the plaintiff in all material respects. In evaluating whether two employees are directly comparable, the court must look at all relevant factors, including whether the employees hold the same description, the title description for the job, were subject to the same standards, were even subordinate to the same supervisor, and had comparable experience, education, or other qualifications, provided the employer considered these later factors in making the personnel decision. Intentional discrimination must be established for Title VII. The fact of a pay differential satisfies the burden of proof under the EPA. Make sure you know this distinction. The law allows plaintiffs to bring lawsuits involving pay differentials, pay disparity, if applicable under both Title VII and the EPA. Now, the EPA under federal law originated in 1963. In Illinois, the EPA was passed in 2003. In Illinois, we actually have an Equal Pay Act that mirrors to some extent the federal Equal Pay Law. In Illinois, the Equal Pay Act prohibits discrimination between employees on the basis of sex by paying wages to an employee at a rate less than the rate at which the employer pays wages to another employee of the opposite sex for the same or substantially similar work on jobs, the performance of which requires equal skill, effort, and responsibility, and which are performed under similar working conditions. Sounds very similar to the EPA under federal law, does it not? An employer may not retaliate against an employee with respect to wage or compensation inquiries and actions. So there is an anti-retaliation aspect built within Illinois law as well. The employer in Illinois includes the state of Illinois, a state agency, a unit of local government, and a school district. This act is applicable, therefore, also to private and public sector employers and employees. The act applies to all employers, regardless of number of employees, effective January 1 of 2016. So there is no number jurisdictional requirement. With Title VII, we know that there's a jurisdictional requirement for size, and that being the size of the employer or workforce being 15 or more. In Illinois, there is no size comparative 
one employee is sufficient to invoke jurisdiction under the Equal Pay Act of 2003. The Equal Pay Act requires an employer to post a notice in their workplace summarizing workers' rights under the Act. Let's talk about the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act of 2009. That's found also in your readings within the textbook. The Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act is a federal statute that was the first bill signed into law by President Barack Obama on January 29, 2009. The act amends the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Please examine that law in detail. You will also find in your uh, course notices this week that an extra credit opportunity is available based on information that you want to develop. It's elective, it's not mandatory relating to the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act of 2009. You are invited to write a two-page paper about the act, and there's more instructions and details that will be provided in short order. So we're not going to spend a lot of time in this segment talking about the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act of 2009. Uh, I'm going to let that be up to uh, your own reading and your further analysis if you choose to make it into an extra credit opportunity. Disparate treatment. We're going to focus on the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. The Age Discrimination and Employment Act was passed in 1967. Most ADA claims are pursued under a disparate treatment theory of discrimination. To prove a claim for age discrimination, a plaintiff must establish by a preponderance of the evidence that the defendant intentionally discriminated against the plaintiff because of age. Under the ADEA, the plaintiff must prove that age was a but-for cause of action. Now that standard changed with the Supreme Court's decision in 2009 with the case of Gross versus FBL Financial Services. And that's also noted within your textbook reading. That means that in an age claim, the plaintiff cannot succeed unless the plaintiff proves that his or her age not only played an actual role in the employer's decision, but that it had a determinative influence on the outcome. Following the Supreme Court's decision in Gross, no mixed motive ADEA claims are allowed, and the evidence of disparate treatment may be direct or circumstantial. So we're focusing now in this segment on the Age Discrimination in Employment Act. And the act protects individuals who are 40 years of age or older from employment discrimination based, of course, on age. The ADEA protections apply to both employees and job applicants. So there's pre-hiring considerations as well. Under the ADEA, it is unlawful to discriminate against a person because of his or her age with respect to any term, condition, or privilege of employment, including hiring, firing, promotion, layoff, compensation, benefits, job assignments, and training. So it's very similar to the protections afforded relating to Title VII. But here, of course, the focus is on age. The ADEA permits employers, however, to favor older workers based on age, even if doing so adversely affects a younger worker who is 40 years of age or older. 
So the law allows for employers to favor older workers. Younger employees under age 40 are traditionally not within the protected classification that makes up the Age Discrimination in Employment Act. The Age Discrimination in Employment Act also prohibits retaliation against an individual for imposing employment practices that discriminate based on age or for filing an age discrimination charge, testifying or participating in any way in an investigation, proceeding, or litigation under the ADEA. So, like other statutory claims that we have discovered in our study this semester so far, there is also an anti-retaliation component built within the structure of the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. And we've studied retaliation already in detail, so we should know what it is and how to recognize it the effects of retaliation. Let's talk about size in terms of the jurisdictional requirements. The ADA applies to employers with 20 or more employees. Now under Illinois law, under the Illinois Human Rights Act, there is a prohibition against age as well. So we know from our previous studies and discussion that there may be corollary state laws in some jurisdictions and in Illinois we have of course the Illinois Human Rights Act which which is administered by the Illinois Department of Human Rights. The age discrimination laws under Illinois allow for 15 or more employees for there to be jurisdiction. Under federal law, there must be 20 or more employees to invoke the jurisdictional requirements um, and to have age discrimination laws under the ADEA apply. Let's talk about disparate impact. And again, this is just by way of review. We know what disparate impact is. By now, we should. And we know what disparate treatment is. These are the two major theories involving discrimination claims. The Supreme Court has ruled that disparate impact claims of age discrimination are permitted under the ADEA. And that case was decided in 2005 by the Supreme Court in Smith versus City of Jackson, Mississippi. That case is also found within your textbook reading. The city of Jackson, Mississippi adopted a pay plan giving raises to all police officers and police dispatchers. To bring starting salaries up to regional averages, officers with less than five years of service received proportionally greater raises than those with more uh, than those with more than seniority and most officers over age 40 had more than five years of service. The plaintiffs, a group of older officers, sued under the ADA, claiming that they were adversely affected by the plan because of their age. The district court, and that's the trial court, granted summary judgment in favor of the city. We know what summary judgment is. The Fifth Circuit ruled that disparate impact claims are categorically unavailable under the ADEA. Again, the traditional focus has been disparate treatment, not disparate impact, at least under the ADEA. The Supreme Court affirmed that, affirmed the decision in favor of the city with these particular facts. But, the Supreme Court said that the disparate impact theory of recovery may be available under the ADA. The Supreme Court ruled that the city's decision to grant a larger raise to lower echelon employees for the purpose of bringing salaries in line with that of surrounding police forces was a decision based on, and here we go with the standard, 
reasonable factor other than age that was aimed at the legitimate objective goal of training police officers. We should know by now reasonable factor other than age, reasonable factor other than sex, reasonable factor other than the protected uh, prohibitions are defenses that can be raised. The Supreme Court agreed with the Court of Appeals decision in favor of the city, but specifically ruled that the disparate impact theory is available under the ADEA. I want you to turn to a case that I've included in your reading materials. It's supplemental, and it's a case decided by the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in 2004. So it's dated, and this case uh, presents an earlier standard when there was a motivating factor standard as opposed to a but-for standard used to show disparate treatment with regard to age discrimination claims. Please examine this case handout. Read through the facts very carefully. In that case, the plaintiff alleged that his employer discriminated against him in violation of the ADEA. The plaintiff presented evidence showing that his job performance was satisfactory and that his employer hired a substantially younger employee in age to replace him, even though his replacement had no experience. According to the facility manager of the plant where the plaintiff worked, the replacement employee was no more qualified than the plaintiff. Those facts, coupled with the plaintiff's supervisor's remark that the plaintiff was undesirable because of his age, were sufficient to let a jury, which is the decider of fact, decide whether the plaintiff's age actually played a role in the employer's decision to terminate his employment. This past fall in 2016, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals established a different standard than the standard that is used in the, or that was used in the Olson versus Northern FS uh, Inc. case. The standard today in the Seventh Circuit does not put as much stock into this so-called indirect and direct method but instead focuses on a totality, totality of circumstances and examines the contextual background and considers all the evidence, all the evidence in whether or not a disparate treatment theory of discrimination is applicable to show a, viola to show a violation. But I wanted to show you this particular case in terms of the focus, uh, and the uh, establishing a prima facie case using the McDonnell Douglas standards, which you'll see within a close reading of this uh, particular decision. It certainly exemplifies an aspect of discrimination that may seem rather obvious, but again, needs to be sorted out carefully with regard to the legal analysis that's set forth. Let's turn to the concept of age harassment. Age harassment. Can someone be harassed because of their age? Can someone be harassed in the same sense that one is harassed because of their gender or their race or their origin or their religious preference? Well, courts have recognized that age harassment is an actionable claim. The standards for an age discrimination claim are higher than a claim of discrimination on the basis of race, color, sex, religion, or national origin under Title VII, in which a plaintiff must prove no more than his or her protected status was a motivating factor for an adverse employment action. Courts do not have or have not appeared to have applied the motivating factor standard when considering age harassment cases. 
uh, if you're looking at this uh, uh, slide carefully, courts, it should be do not uh, or have not appeared to apply the motivating factor standard. So uh, please excuse the uh, typos here in this particular slide. I think we can understand though the reference to motivating factor standard and under the age discrimination case analysis now it is a but for standard. I put a footnote on the bottom of this uh, slide the Supreme Court decision in the case of Desert a palace, it's desert palace. In such mixed motive cases under Title VII, a plaintiff's proof that discrimination played even a, a part in an adverse employment action shifts the burden of proof to the employer to show that it would have taken the same action regardless of the protected characteristics. In other words, if the evidence shows that the adverse action may have been partly tainted by discrimination, the employer is required to prove that its action was actually supported by legitimate reasons in order to in order for it to avoid liability age harassment what needs to be established to prove a prima facie case of hostile work environment on the basis of age a plaintiff needs to show no more than one that the employee is 40 years of age or older two that the employee was subjected to harassment through words of action based on age, through words or action based on age, words or action based on age. Three, that the harassment had the effect of unreasonably interfering with the employer's work performance and creating an objectively intimidating, hostile, or offensive work environment. Now, we've heard that standard before under Title VII, have we not? And four, there has to be a factual basis for ascribing liability to the employer. In other words, the facts have to justify that type of claim. Let's again look at damages and remedies for violations of the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. Let's examine what is available if there's a violation. As in a Title VII case, an ADA plaintiff can recover attorney's fees, back pay, reinstatement, instatement, or front pay. The ADA does not allow the recovery of compensatory or punitive damages. A plaintiff under the ADA can recover liquidated damages in cases in which the employer commits a willful violation of the ADEA. In such instances, a plaintiff can recover liquidated damages equal to the amount of his or her back pay award. So like the EPA, liquidated damages are available. The ADEA traces its legislative origin also to the FLSA. Now that may be somewhat unique in that the ADEA occurred after the Title VII Civil Rights Act was passed, but the legislative history indicates that its source originates in terms of the legal standards and concepts from the FLSA with regard to damages and rights for recovery. For a hostile work environment claim relating to age, the plaintiff may recover emotional distress damages similar to those available under Title VII. Now please note the difference. Under age discrimination claims, Compensatory damages are unavailable. Economic damages are the recovery. Hostile work environment claims relating to age harassment, the plaintiff may recover emotional distress damages similar to those available under Title VII. 
Finally, let's look at the Older Workers Benefit Protection Act, the OWBPA. The Older Worker Benefit Protection Act of 1990 amended the ADEA by prohibiting age discrimination in employment benefits and establishing minimum standards for determining the validity of waivers of age claims. The OWBPA establishes that the ADEA prohibition of discrimination in compensation, terms, conditions, or privileges of employment encompasses all employee benefits, including those provided under a bona fide employee benefit plan. Let's look at some of the exemptions and defenses. And this also is found, of course, in your textbook. The ADA sets forth certain exemptions. These are exemptions. An employer does not commit an ADEA violation when the individual is terminated because of a bona fide seniority plan. Likewise, the employer does not violate the ADEA when it disciplines or discharges an employee for good cause. When does the ADEA get violated? If there's a discriminatory reason, intent, intent based on age. The ADA also permits the compulsory retirement of certain bona fide executives or high ranking policy personnel at age 65. Again, your textbook has examples of those scenarios. An employer defenses for reasonable factors other than age and bona fide occupational qualifications, the BFOQ, are available. Generally, the BFOQ defense is raised by employers in cases involving public safety. So these exemptions, you might want to think of as exceptions, exceptions to the general rule that it's discriminatory to treat one differently, adversely, because of their age. Let's talk about waivers. Waivers, and that's in the context here of your course material under the Older Worker Benefit Protection Act. Employers may, from time to time, reduce its workforce and terminate individuals who fall within an age-protected classification. Remember, we have, for the most part, unless there's a union setting, an at-will employment environment, or unless the employee and the employer have a contract that sets forth the term or time frame in which the employment exists. The employer may provide severance and other benefits to the separated employee that is not otherwise obligated, but may condition receipt of same upon the employee's release and waiver of claims. Severance is considered as a gratuity. It is not mandated by law. Sometimes employers use severance as an offer to transition individuals from the period when their job ends until hopefully the time when they're reemployed. Many employers will use that severance, however, as contract consideration to bind a release of claims and waiver of rights. To the extent the receipt of such severance or separation consideration requires the release and waiver of the employee's age rights and claims, Congress, with the passage of the Older Workers Benefit Protection Act of 1990, sought to protect those separated employees. Now again, I'm going to remind you to think about what's taking place in our society when these acts were passed. Back in the late 1980s, there was an economic recession. Companies were forced to close their doors or reduce their workforces because of the very poor economy. They offered, on occasion, employees to consider separation packages 
that contained severance offers. Sometimes situations existed when employees were not given very much time to consider whether to accept the severance, knowing that they've just lost their jobs, or whether to forego those severance rather than to sign a release and waiver of their age rights and claims that may have existed. Congress addressed that very scenario. According to the Older Worker Benefit Protection Act, specific statutory requirements must be met before an employee can legally waive the right to litigate ADA claims. Now the EEOC has jurisdiction to investigate ADEA claims. You have to go through the EEOC first. Unlike the EPA, you can't go directly to court in a state or a federal uh, court and initiate the case. You have to go through the EEOC first. And then of course, after the EEOC process, a right to sue may be issued and then private litigation can follow. The burden of proof for establishing the waiver rests upon the employer, which must establish that all of the, all of the requirements are met. Let's turn to what are those requirements. The requirements include the following. And this is all within your textbook. One, the waiver is part of a written agreement. Two, the waiver specifically must reference rights or claims under the ADEA and may also refer to Title VII and other claims as well. But the focus of the OWBPA is on age, rights, and claims. Three, it does not apply to rights or claims that may occur after the agreement is signed. Only what has taken place prior and to the point when the agreement is offered. Four, the waiver is exchanged for value that is in addition to what the employee would otherwise be entitled to receive. So, by way of an example, if the company already has a severance plan or a severance policy that provides one week for every year of service, if that's already established without the condition of imposing a release or a waiver to receive that, then the employee already has that opportunity and need not sign this type of a waiver. They're already entitled to it. But most employers will condition severance eligibility on whether the employee has agreed to waive their rights and relinquish their claims. A five, the employee must be given written advice that the employer is to consult with an attorney. That should be uh, information that is in writing to allow the employee to recognize that this is a legal, potentially binding document that ought to be reviewed by counsel. That warning must exist for there to be an effective waiver under the OWBPA. And lastly, the employee is given 21 days to consider the agreement and a seven day period to revoke the agreement. In other words, the employee is not gonna be pressured into signing the agreement at the time when it's presented, like perhaps those occasions occurred uh, before the passage of the OWBPA of 1990. Instead, the employee will be given 21 days to consider the agreement. Now they can sign the agreement at any time throughout that 21 day period. But the bottom line is they have a federal statutory right to consider whether to accept the offered consideration, waive age rights, release 
age claims within that time frame. Uh, the employee could sign it on the fifth day. The employee could wait and sign it on the 21st day. But whatever day they decide to sign it within that offer time frame, Congress also built in a so-called cooling off period of seven days. Congress wanted the employee to have the benefit of perhaps hindsight and to reconsider what actions they've taken to release their claims and waive their rights. So again, this is a very protective measure. That is another example of regulation within our workplaces where Congress is concerned about rights of employees. For an agreement in connection with an early retirement program offered to a group of employees, the waiting period is 45 days rather than 21 and the employer must disclose all eligibility factors and the terms and inclusions of the program. Courts have determined that an effective release must comply with each, each of the OWBPA prerequisites and that substantial compliance with the act is inadequate. Now there's a case in your textbook where in the United States Supreme Court decided in 1998 uh, the situation of an inadequate release and waiver in the Obrey versus Entergy Operations Inc. case. Please read that case if you haven't already and look especially at some of the questions that follow that case which are very thought-provoking that Professor Twomey has outlined in your uh, textbook. So we have now concluded an examination of the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, the Older Worker Benefit Protection Act, the Equal Pay Act, and the Age Discrimination Act. Note the differences. Note the similarities to Title VII. Please understand how the remedial provisions apply with regard to damages and relief in the event that there's been a violation. Thank you.